Welcome to a very special episode of the Mike Sinello Show. Today, we are using a different camera because I forgot my capture card at home. Wouldn't be an episode of the Mike Sinello Show without technical difficulties. So hopefully the audio will come in at least okay because tonight we're going to be talking about free speech. And it's a conversation that the events of last week here in New Milford and with the Biden administration, Biden administration creating a literal ministry of truth we kind of have no choice here. My hand is my, you know, my, I have to play this hand. Um, we have to be top, have a conversation about free speech, not just because of what happened in DC, but also because of what's happened here in New Milford during the past week. So we have to start, of course, with a conversation about what is free speech, because it's more than just something enshrined into our, into the first amendment of the bill of rights of our founding document. Uh, not our founding document, but the, the single thing that forms the backbone of the spirit of all of governance in this country, which is that First Amendment. And the most important aspect of that is that speech. In this case, speech, as Jordan Peterson has intimated, is more than just the words coming out of your mouth. It's more than just utterances being made by the, in, the, in the, laryngeal, the, the laryngeal cavities of the throat. Right, it's more than the, your vocal cords vibrating. There are ideas that are being communicated. It is our way of, in our mind, engaging with the world. It is, if you, because we've talked about this before on my YouTube channel, at least, a, absolutely identical to the notion of consciousness of mind. This is the thing upon which we're able to say humans have agency. Right? The fact that we can communicate that humans have agency means humans have agency. This is an axiomatic principle when it comes to viewing what is right and wrong in the world. When that's where that starts from. It starts from the spirit of the fact that we have agency. It doesn't originate in the Constitution, just like all rights do not originate in the Constitution. They pre-exist government and any founding documents related there, too. And that's why a reasonable person will actually be something of a free speech absolutist like myself. As in, when it comes to strictly speech, you are supposed to adhere to the end, a notion of sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, on that note, time, manner, and place are not speech. The mere words coming out of my mouth, the mere conveyance of ideas, and nothing else is speech. But if there's something built on top of that, or where the, the speech tends to morph into something else which is not speech, for example, a threat, a call to action. In the case of a call to action, we're not dealing with speech, we're dealing with a call to action. And what happens with a call to action is that there is the action that is built into the thing. When it comes to me saying something like, uh, you know, my brother has farty pants, right? My brother's far smart farts smell really bad. I can be saying all of those things and there's nothing associated with that other than the idea that's being transmitted. If I say, my brother's farts has farty pants and he smells real bad, so somebody go, at, go kick his ass for having, his literal ass for having such smelly farts. Then there's the actual foot in the ass. That foot in the ass is not speech. And that's why that morphs into something beyond speech, into something called a, a, a call to action. In the same way, time, manner, and place are not speech. And the perfect example of that is, if you guys disagree, put your address in the comment section so that I can bring a bullhorn and 10,000 of my friends over to your house at 2 o'clock in the morning without you, without you knowing about it otherwise to shout and scream until the, until the megaphones, which are commercial-grade megaphones in this case, just create a feedback loop so loud that it genuinely actually bursts eardrums, it genuinely actually causes the medical condition of a ruptured eardrum. No. And nobody in here is going to be willing to do that. No one in here is going to be willing to allow me to do that. And the reason is that that's the case is you'll say, well, it's private property. Correct. Your property is not speech. That's place. Two o'clock in the morning is a time, not speech. The volume that we're speaking at, the, the shrill noise, the high-pitched high -pitch squeal that is the feedback loop created by 10,000 megaphones just being screamed into by, by all of these people you don't know, that's the manner of the speech, not the speech itself. That's not the ideas. That's not the conveyance. 
That could literally just be dogs barking into a microphone. Orf, 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 orf. Does that convey anything? No. No. And just like in your home where you're not going to let just anyone come on and scream at you at 2 o'clock in the morning, there are, there are elements of these meetings that we have in town to run our government that have... Where, where, there is, where there are restraints on time, manner, and place, just like they are really on this show. For example, you are not allowed to hijack my feed. You are not allowed to, to let's say, find a way to hack your way into my, into my feed and then overtake my camera. You're not allowed to do that. This is my show. And you know what? If somebody's going to be completely a, a complete clown, I don't invite them on the show. Or if I invite them on the show and they become a complete clown, I kick them off. And these are my rules. One of my other rules for myself is that I try to treat my guests as though they are guests. I could be a complete jerk to them right off the bat when they come on the show, but that's a rule I have for myself on this show that is limited to the confines of me in this show. And the same thing is tr- so. So the the whole point is to, there's two elements of free speech that I think are being missed, one by one side, and one the, by the other. And the one that's being missed by the side that opposes Elon Musk buying Twitter and is gaslighting Elon into saying that free speech absolutism means he's just buying Twitter so he can use Twitter to violate the law. No, of course, that's not where free speech, that's that's not true. Of course, you're not allowed to use um, Twitter, Elon's new platform, uh, to violate the law by law. And by the spirit of the thing, you can't expect a company to allow you to use that company to break the law in the same way you can't expect tailors to allow you to use its bathrooms to rape little girls. Uh, And I'll just go to the hyperbolic extreme in the same way you can't use Taylor's phone system to call mob hits on somebody. Right. And and I I understand that there is a worldview, the Voschian worldview that is so consequentialist. And, and so rejects causality and so determinist that it rejects causality. And we'll, we'll talk about that on a different show. We won't have time to get into the, into the philosophy but, uh, beyond all this. That he, rege- that he winds up rejecting causality. This is, this is a left-wing take only where, where you re- wind up rejecting causality to such a degree that things like you pulling the trigger isn't necessarily you being at fault for killing somebody. And in fact, the gun can't even be held responsible in that case because who's actually determining whether or not the, the bullet is going to go in a certain direction? How do you know the bullet is going to go from the gun in that direction and go towards that person and do the thing that it's going to do that person? Yeah, yeah. No, so one side of the aisle doesn't understand that free speech isn't just the, a, a law. It isn't just whatever is written in the Constitution because that can be that we could we could erase amend the Constitution to erase that. It would be a terrible day if we ever did that, but it could be done. No, free speech pre-exists government. And then the thing that the other side of the aisle tends to get wrong here in New Milford, at least, is the notion that that speech is speech. It's not time, manner, and place. These are not speech, right? So it is not completely unwarranted to have a governing body request civility in its room in the, in by, by way of having rules over time, manner, and place, which we are definitely going, go, we're definitely going to get into. And again, we have, these, we have rules even on my show. Even where I'm a free speech absolutist, we do have some minor rules of, of order just so it doesn't become a completely unwatchable, garbled mess. If I invite two or three people on the show and they constantly talk over each other, you guys won't be able to to pick anything out over that. So if I were to do that, yeah, I would try to, in the case of a debate, actually moderate debate. Otherwise, it becomes completely unwatchable. And at formal governmental meeting, there are rules of order. And in many ways, some of those rules of order are there to protect free speech. For example, at a town council meeting, you will get your five minutes. You will get it. The, the rules on the books are that you, you get five minutes, period. And we'll get into more details on that matter in just a minute. But you can't just have one person hog the mic for four straight hours. So that's why there's that limitation on the amount of time. Not the speech, not the content, but the amount of time. And we're, we're, we're all going to come back to this throughout the course of the show, which is almost certainly going to run long. So strap in, folks. 
And the other thing, too, is at these town council meetings, at board of ed meetings, you can't expect these boards to allow literally anything to be said. And I'm going to use Amy Fotopoulos as an example because we're going to talk about her in a minute. Uh, in a positive light, I don't like to dunk on people for no good reason. But you can't say something like Amy Fotopoulos is, is next in line. Uh, so since she's the next one after me, if she, if she comes to the podium, everyone in this room should tackle her and beat her mercilessly. You can't do that. You can't have that be allowed at public comment. Now, uh, again, part of that is because what this is is actually a call to action. It isn't just speech. It's a call to action. In the same way, you can't intimidate her or explicitly or implicitly. And again, we're going to come back to intimidation later throughout the course of the show and what is allowed and what isn't allowed and why, why some of those things are reasonable to allow and to disallow when it comes to public comment. The meetings, by the way, so people understand, exist. The only reason the meetings, is, the meetings don't exist for, you, for, for a circus show. The re meetings don't exist so you guys get a, get a, a microphone and a, and, a, and a video camera, right? I have my show so I can get a microphone and a, and a video camera and I can say as much as I want, just about as, whatever I want and just about as much of it as I, as I want to say. The meetings exist to conduct the business of those bodies and nothing else. And again, thank God we live in a country where we can have shows like the Max Nello show, where I get as much time to say just about whatever I want. And if you want to mouth off, the comments section is below. You get to mouth off here. I don't delete comments, right? If you, if you want to mouth off and have me interact with that, again, comment section is below. This is why we do a live Q&A. You know it's basically a free-for-all here. You know those are the rules coming in. And if you don't want to participate in the free-for-all, there's the door. You, get, you don't have to participate in this. When it comes to these government meetings, you don't get to mouth off. And quite frankly, you know, in my conversations with the community, if the community is going to just re reject civility, then fine. If you want incivility, you get it. And my response is, screw you. If you want incivility, then screw you. That's my incivility in response to the incivility. You can still say some really a mutually assured destruction, excuse me, until everyone in the room can agree on civility is what I'm doing here. If, you're, if, if, if the town is just going to reject civility as a community, then screw the town and screw the community. And that's my, my incivil response to a rejection of civility. I really hope that's not the case. I really don't want that to be the case. I really hope that's not the case. But that said, you can still say some really, really damning things at public comment. I did. And we'll talk about that later in the show. But before we go into town, town, into town, town council meeting, let's talk about last week's Board of Ed meeting. Not only the actual business that was taking place, but what happened in that meeting. First things first, so people know, yes, I was there to attend public comment because I thought there were some things that were going to be said that I would, need to ha that I would feel the need to rebut. They weren't really said. I didn't feel the need to rebut them at public comment in the middle of that meeting. Plus, the rest of the, the, rest of the agenda was pretty, uh, by, the, by the paper of the thing, pretty boring clerical formalities for all intents and purposes. So, you know, I kind of figured the fireworks were over because the agenda kind of indicated that the fireworks would be, o would be over. So after a little over an hour of public comment, I went home. So everything I'm getting to you folks is the things that I've gotten from the tape and relating to you what I can with great confidence say happened during the meeting from the people I've talked to that I trust. So I have it on a good account that the things that I'm saying happened. Now, as far as like deriving from that opinion and extracting from that, from that an opinion, I do that on my own. As you guys know, I do that on my own. So the first things first, what happened was that the, town, the Board of Ed meeting got moved from its regular location inside the library, which can only host a few people watching, to the cafeteria of Sarah Noble Intermediate School, where you can have hundreds of people in the room uh, following along. And there were hundreds of people in the room following along, I'd guess around 300 um, youth and adults. Uh, and they were, and at public comment, Wendy, the chairperson who has, chair, chairman, sorry, who has a lot of discretion over what she allows at, at, at um, well, she has some discretion as to what is allowed during public comment, said that she would leave public comment open for one hour and give everybody three minutes. These things are amendable as the meeting goes on. So folks know uh, that's less so with the town council, which we're going to get into uh, in a bit. Rules governing these two bodies are a little bit different, and the rules that they have adopted for themselves are a little bit different. But m 
for the most part, I'd say it was about 85% at public comment, high schoolers saying how much they love Mr. Manka, right? And that's about it. There was a small contingent that I would say was actually speaking towards a petition that we talked about last week. And I, 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 I spent an extra hour on this show. I let the show run an extra hour over time talking about that petition. We covered it in great detail. We showed the whole petition. We showed the context surrounding the petition. We showed the purveyors of the petition and their thoughts surrounding the thing. We scrolled through and went through your commentary and we read the petition here on the show. And I don't need to get any, into any greater detail than because we went through that than that the petition goes way over the line. goes way over the line and there's no reason for me Given what the petition and the surrounding ethos and spirit of the thing has, has provided, there's no reason for me to call for Mr. Corpo's job or, God forbid, her head. And I definitely cannot get, get on board with demanding the state dissolve the Board of Education and overtake its responsibilities should the Board of Education not basically force Mr. Manky to start to continue working at New Milford High School. And, you know... A lot of the people that spoke positively about Mr. Manka, they were met with lots of cheering and people really, really liked it. Now, Wendy, the chair, chairman, wanted everyone to kind of settle down and she explained it as, listen, we've got a lot of things to do. We are here to conduct the business of the Board of Education. It's kind of like a courtroom. You can't have hooting, hooting and hollering in a courtroom. You can't have cheering and yelling in a courtroom. And again, because it interferes with the conducting of the business of the meeting. There's also something to be said about, well, I mean, there's, there is something to be said about, well, what happens when the opposition steps to the microphone? Now, my opinion on that is if they're going to hoot and holler and then hiss and boo, as long as they're not hissing and booing while I'm speaking, I don't care. My personal take is I've been to the podium. We all remember that Board of Finance public hearing where I was the first one to speak and in three minutes in a room with 300 people in it, I shut them up up with facts, right? And the whole place was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop and it was glorious. But that's how you deal with that. So to me, you know, if people are going to hoot and holler and that's going to be an excuse, at, you know, between people who are speaking to say, nah, you know what? People are uncomfortable going to the microphone because of the, the you know, the, because of the mob's uh, general opinion of them. No. Now, if the mob starts doing things that are either in violation of the terms of the hearing or are interrupting them or are, you know, doing things that are actual intimidation so that when they leave the meeting, they actually have a fear for safety, which I don't think was going on, really. Um, yeah, that's, that's crossing a line. That's going too far. But Wendy Fallenbach was not wrong to try to tell folks to at least try. Like, folks, I get it. I get it. You guys love Mr. Manka. Great. Say so in public comment. That's what it's there for. In fact, if you want to hijack this meeting, I've given you all three minutes. I'm going to give you a ton of time. And Ms. Fowlback absolutely would have given way more than an hour. And they did go over an hour. Just line them up. At, at three people. You get three minutes. Just a hundred, all 300 people. Just use up all three minutes saying how much you like Mr. Manka. And, the, the, and then that point will be just beaten home. And the people that go to the microphone in that situation and don't hear hooting and hollering are still going to hear 300 people going to the microphone and saying how great Mr. Manka is and how much they despise, you know, Mr. Corpo. And if you're the one person, then you accept that you're the one person in the room. You accept that if you're right, that you're Galileo in the room. And the mere fact that there are people who disagree with you in the room, that's not grounds to stifle them. That's not grounds to, to raise any complaints, right? And, you know, I, I talked about I, I brought up Amy Fotopoulos' name, not because I was trying to dunk on her, but I did need a name just for the sake of clarity. And I told you we were going to speak about all of this because if I may refer back to the petition and asking for someone's job, the folks in the crowd and the audience that were hooting and hollering in favor of this and yelling for the favor of this, this is not me. This is not me dunking on people who are hooting and hollering in the crowd. This is more me dunking on the idea that it is that that this petition is appropriate at this time and the, it's appropriate at this time with this petition that 1,700 people agree with to ask for Mr. Corpo's job? Yeah, no, I talked about how this was going way over the line and in the case of Amy Fotopoulos, the reason I bring her up, bring her up is because she was basically the only one in the room 
not the only one, but basically the only one in the room that was willing to dive on the hand grenade. And the main thesis she presents is, I have to agree with her. I have to agree with her. And this is a reason I bring up her name because if Amy Fotopoulos and I agree on something and we agree on nothing politically, like I guarantee you our ballots in, in November 2021 were mirror opposites of each other. If the two of us on principle agree on the main thesis, then I'm sorry. But even if we're in the minority, everyone else is probably wrong. You're probably doing something wrong. And the fact that Amy Fotopoulos went to the microphone and went to the podium in the face of the fact that there are 1,700 people signing this petition asking for Mr. Corpo's head, basically, and a room full of people that definitely did not agree with her. You know, this is a lot of, this is a lot of act. And when somebody from the proverbial other side, if you're going to call it that, says, some, says the right thing in the face of kind of what I think is the, is, is the wrong sentiment, I hate to say it, folks, Amy Fotopoulos is 100% correct. And again, there were some things that she said that were incorrect, but her main thesis, which I'm about to show you in just a second, can't disagree with it. Go ahead, Amy. Uh, Mr. Minka seems to have a huge fan base, and um, unfortunately, I don't know him very well, so I'm here to speak about something else. Um, Mr. Corpo ha was named interim superintendent in the fall of 2020 and later installed as superintendent in February of the following year, and her appointment was unanimous by all the Board of um, Education members at the time. During her time in this position, has there been significant turnover among teachers and school district administrators? Yes. Yes, there has, um, but the context matters. This town has had high turnover for years and that predated Ms. DeCorpo's appointment. Do you remember Carrie Parker? Maybe not, she was here for less than a year and she left just as plans for safe return to school were under development, which Ms. DeCorpo picked up and ran with. As a district, we have had a very difficult time keeping teachers, keeping support staff, keeping administrators, and yes, superintendents. My son had five different speech therapists in almost as many years, and this all also predated Ms. DeCorpo's appointment. Do we need to take a closer look at why people are leaving? Yes, we do. We know that many industries were impacted by the great migration of talent during COVID. Nationwide, throughout our state, and in our beautiful town, people left their jobs. They changed careers, they took time off, or they simply decided to retire. And educators did the same thing. Some did it after dealing with the unprecedented challenges and the added stressors due to remote learning, hybrid learning, combination of the two, not knowing when it was going to change, new technology, blah, blah, blah. 100% correct. Not one thing untrue. Not one thing incorrect. Now, the reasons behind all of that that she's going to offer in just a second aren't correct. But, and I, and I went into this in much greater detail last, on the show last week. All of the complaints that she talked about that were being raised in the room aren't a complaint of, of Superintendent Corpo. There aren't even really a complaint of the superintendent position, which has been an absolute rotisserie, a revolving damn door until Mr. Corpo came along. If there was one administrative position that has been that rotating spit more than any other administrative position, it's been the superintendent's position until she came along, you know, a until she came along. And we went into this, in, again, we went into this in much greater detail last week, but there, I, on this alone, I can't agree with the petition, let alone when it comes to the dis dissolution of the Board of Education. Now, again, Emmy's a little bit wrong when it comes to why she thinks that's the case. It isn't just money, but she continues, and a lot of this, again, she's going to sh extend on the main thesis, and the main thesis she's presenting isn't wrong. New Milford, we know, is also not as competitive with salaries as other districts. That has been discussed time and time again. As a citizen, I would like to encourage the district to ensure that HR conducts exit interviews with staff and invites feedback from existing employees as well to gather candid feedback so that the district can address how we can show up as a top employer that not only attracts top talent, but maintains them. I understand these kinds of specifics are confidential. However, I encourage the board to consider creatively whether there is a way that overall patterns and consistent feedback can be grouped and shared back with the public. Now, she's 100% correct in saying that it's, it is illegal to say that Jim Smith 
uh, in his exit interview said that the reason he left left was X. But what you can say is that we had 19 people say the reason we left was X and one person who said that the reason we left was Y. And we're not bringing any clarity onto who those people are. We're not talking about the people or the content of that interview or invading the privacy of the speech that was offered in that interview. We're looking at a broad statistic, at a broad data point, and that's all we're looking at. Now, speaking to that, here's what's effectively a voluntarily offered uh exit interview. It's not just money. Money is not the sole, the, the salary myth is just that. It's a, it's a myth. Mr. Corpo is working for the, for, uh, was working until just a few months ago for the exact same dollar amount that all the other revolving door, the cl absolute clown car of, of, uh, pre, uh, superintendents prior. She took the exact same dollar amount and she's been here. So what's what actually in the case of the superintendent, clearly she's not doing it for money. She was here. She went. She was a direct witness to this spit of of superintendents. And she came in anyways. Like she's got to know that there's a pattern to why they're leaving. And if she's doing it for the, if she's if she's taking the position for the exact same dollar amount, we've done our independent variable control. Like with the number of people that have, have left have left in such short order, we have a large enough sample size. It's not money. And uh, uh, you know, again, this is true. This is true of basically all positions. And if you've ever done any research on the matter, which we've we've talked about on the show, this is not why people leave. This is not the single attractor to jobs. It's not like if you get a job offer while you're already working at Milford Public Schools to go work in Brookfield for one dollar a year more, you're going to move to Brookfield. That's not true. And actually, we have a former teacher, a, a, a former employee, is what she calls herself. That explains just that point. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Betsy Stewart. Um, I am a former employee. I actually was hired in 2018 uh, through Alicia DeCorpo. Um, I entered New Milford coming from a district that paid more. I'm going to be honest. Um, I was offered two jobs when I applied to New Milford, one in another district. I'm not going to say which district. Um, when I entered New Milford, I actually took a pay cut. Um, and the reason I took the pay cut was because I interviewed with Alicia. Um, Alicia was the driving force that brought me into New Milford. I was an instructional coach and a curriculum coordinator at the time. I worked at New Milford High School. I worked at uh, Scattico Middle School. Um, I did leave the district under Alicia's superintendency. It had nothing to do with that. I was afforded an opportunity in another district um, that I went for. Um, so it had nothing to do with me leaving because of Alicia. If anything, Alicia taught me things that I carry to this new district. And that actually is somewhat in defense of DeCarpo and what she's saying and explaining that like the turnover may not actually necessarily be a bad thing. I've talked about this on the show. If high turnover is what it takes to weed out the proverbial dead weight, and I don't, I just, there's too many people working under the town's head, either at the Board of Ed or, or, or at the town, at the municipal government. When you, when you get to that size, there's just no way that there isn't at least one or two people that are, fill, fill into the category of proverbial dead weight. Proverbial dead weight, not literal dead weight, proverbial dead weight, right? And, you know, I have been trying to stay away from the Mr. Manka thing and away from the, the corporal thing because I'm not as intimately related with these folks as other people might be. I'm trying to make a decision based on the evidence that's presented before me. And as Amy, as Amy has kind of alluded to here, the evidence just isn't there. Now, she actually comes to Mr. Corpo's defense. I, I'm not here to do that, but, you know, she is... She, she is the dissenting voice in the matter, so and we've been talking about her. So I'm going to give her an extra like. Uh, I'm going to show you what her defense of Mr. Corpo is because I'm sure everyone else in the room knows what the other side is. So, uh, Amy, have at it. Mr. Corpo came in during an extremely challenging moment in time, and as a member of the public, I have been very impressed with the rigor that you have shown and your thoughtful and thorough approach that you have channeled throughout your work. Your presentations and your preparation for the annual budget planning cycles have been the best that I have seen during the years that I have lived here. Amy? Yes. I, think you could I will wrap it up. I'm sorry. Thank you so um, much. You have been an advocate for our students. I have seen your care and your concern in your eyes when we have had to make difficult uh, budget choices, when the ESS program was cut, et cetera. I know you care about our kids. I thank you for the work that you've done and you continue to do. And to all involved, but not the public standing behind me, if these things are important to you, please come out and vote in support of our education budget. So again, she's kind of alluding to the fact that it's money that drives all of this, and it's not. We've talked about this on the show 
endlessly. We've I've put out a whole video with dozens of source citations. Overall spending on public education K through 12 is not correlated with educational outcomes and if there is one, it's a very very slightly negative correlation, not a positive one. But to that effect, uh, the one thing that that she's talking about here that there may be some real merit to, and I'm, I might actually go so far as to defend because I'm just not as familiar with that, is that, yes, Mr. Corporal's budget presentations have been the only ones that have passed through the Board of Education, the Town Council, the Board of Finance, and uh, the and you guys, and you guys, the voters, at town at the at the referendum without failure. They're the, she's the only one that's been able to do that. So, you know, that I, I believe that it is part of her job description to present a budget that has at least a chance of passing at referendum and that she has a duty in some ways to do the voters in that respect. That duty is more, that falls to me more on the elected officials than the employee of the governing body. Um, but with that said, that is one thing that she's right about that she has been able to do kind of. Um, and the point of me presenting all of this is that although I know nothing about Although as I'm not as intimate, really, intimately involved with these folks as I'd like to be, on principle, Amy and I agree, and I, I, I think we uh, together cannot agree with Mr. Corpo's termination. But the main show, of course, of the night was Mr. Mankus' resignation, principal of New Milford High School. What was going on in this meeting so people understand what the business of the meeting was? is that there was an item on the agenda called Exhibit A. It was a series of documents that were presented to the Board of Education that they had to vote to approve or reject. Almost all of these things are things like uh, agreements to terminate, uh, agreements to, to uh, sorry, letters of resignation, agreements of employment, agreements of termination, all of these kind of clerical things that almost never are of any, uh, are talk of any discussion. And like I said, if it weren't for this one element of the agenda, if it weren't for this petition that being passed around, on paper, the agenda is just boring clerical administrative stuff that I would never bother wasting my time to go to a board of education meeting to see how that goes. If And the only reason I would even suggest anybody do that is to get an understanding of the procedure and how all this works. It, it, these meetings are boring. These meetings are generally speaking boring just like a courtroom. When you go to an actual criminal trial, 99% of the time, what you're going to see in things like Exhibit A is a debate over some sort of procedural error with how things were submitted. And that's basically how this the discussion went during the Board of Education's meeting post-public comment, of course. So let's explain what's going on here. Mr. Manka submitted a letter of resignation. Nobody besides Mr. Manka, to, as far as I can tell, has any re real reason to suggest any new information has come to light other than what's in the resignation. We will, for all intents and purposes, because of what happened that night, probably never know why he filled out, he, he submitted, he wrote and submitted that letter of resignation in the first place, and that's probably a good thing. I previously invited him on my show to talk about this. I'm going to go ahead and continue that extension of invitation, but I think we're really going to have to be very careful here because I, I don't know that there's really anything to discuss beyond that, and especially which wouldn't open up a legal not can of worms, if you will, especially because of his union protection. Exhibit A included his letter of resignation, and what was on the agenda was to either adopt, sorry, accept or reject his resignation. Parliamentarily, what was happening was there was a discussion before all of the hubbub that went on for a long time regard that was regarding the procedure, which was first tabling the entire agenda item, separating the, the, the exhibit into an exhibit A and effectively an exhibit B, which would have been Mr. Manga's resignation, and then voting on them either individually or tabling it. There's a reason that they had to, that they had to go through this. There's a lot of uh, parliamentary procedure. There's a lot of rules of order. There are a lot of things that this governing body has to adhere to, which do include the Connecticut General Statutes, which do include union negotiated contracts. And the, and the long and short of it is they cannot legally force him to keep working there. They can't do it. 
It's super, 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 duper, duper illegal for them to force him to keep working there. And that's, that's effectively what's, what the rationale was for even tabling this in the first place, right? And that's why there were all these parliament, there were all of these procedural issues that came up. And to clarify exactly what we're talking about here in terms of what we're voting on and the issues that arise from it, Eric Hansel does a pretty good job of just clarifying the whole situation. So tonight, everyone has been heard. It really does mean something. Uh, the vote tonight, unfortunately, is not about keeping a revered love for Ray Manka as New Milford High School principal. It is to accept or decline his resignation. Uh, I want it to be different, but neither will keep our principal. Counterintuitively, True. the latter may indeed do more harm than good um, and exasperate the situation. Exacerbate, but the point is absolutely true. That if they don't actually ad accept his letter of resignation, then that might trigger uh, an appeals process through the union that would then trigger a whole lot of other things that might lead to a major courtroom battle by virtue of not accepting his, his resignation. And again, he was the one who submitted it. And between submission and that meeting, he could have rescinded it, which we'll find out later he can do completely unilaterally completely withdraw it before the, the board accepts his letter of resignation. And I think the reason you actually have to vote to accept it is for this reason, so that, it, so that he can no longer rescind his res letter of resignation after it's been submitted and approved. And I believe that's really, from a legal framework, the only reason they actually have to vote on it. This is a clerical thing that can become a major legal issue if you don't adhere to the rules of those clerical procedures. And what what... What Eric Hansel's alluding to there when he talks about making things worse is just this. The triggering of all kinds of things that, that could take place that would make this much worse. As I said, there are, there are potentially very serious consequences for not accepting his, re his resignation. And the, his, the union rep was there at that meeting. And, and we're, we're going to bring that up in just a minute. But if you ever wanted to see the Board of Ed get dissolved by the state, this is how you would do it. This is, this is one of the surest ways to see the state come in and say, whoa, time out. You did what? Nah, you're gone, right? The 13th Amendment exists. You can't force somebody to work somewhere, right? And, and because of that 13th Amendment appeal, do you know how rare it is you have a 13th Amendment appeal? It's super duper 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 rare. And there's a reason for that. Nobody, nobody is dumb enough to get themselves handcuffed by a 13th Amendment appeal, right? And, and the consequences... Uh, that I'm explaining now explicitly are, I'm sure, what Tammy Mac McInerney was implying when she spoke uh, last week as well. I've known Mr. Manka for a very short time. And in that amount of time, I have come to respect him. I thought he was a wonderful principal. Um, I do not know anything about why he is resigning. I feel that we as a board need to respect his decision I do not wish to hurt him any further by prolonging this. Um, and I, I'm very concerned that if we do that, that we are going to be doing more harm than good to this man, that I do not wish to do that. So I just want the board to take that into consideration because we could possibly be doing that. And what she's talking about is the, what was on the, on the table was a motion to effectively table, effectively, not quite there yet, to effectively table this discussion. As in, they, they are basic, they, they're, they, they could expose themselves to a serious legal quandary if they don't make a decision there, in that, in, there that night. And on top of that, there, there's a, a serious legal quandary for not then accepting it. And, you know, if Mr. Corpo is, there, 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 are, there are an infinite array of avenues that Mr. Meka has if, say, Mr. Corpo is out of line when it comes to this conversation. And again, the union is there to protect Mr. Manka. Uh, and because of his position, if it was an actual termination that resulted, and not a failure to re-sign the contract, it would basically, for all intents and purposes, require a hearing. There's a number of procedures that would, that would almost automatically trigger. And that's one of those things, is that hearing. Where all of the dirty laundry would be forced to come to light. 
And if, if, if Mr. Manka is absolutely in the right and Mr. Corpo is not, it is a good thing then if Mr. Corpo is out of line and then terminates him, it is a good thing that we have these, that this, that the dirty laundry then get brought to light because then we know for sure, we know for sure what's taking place behind the scene. We know for sure if somebody's out of line in that case, it is a good thing if that's the case, but uh, but that's not what's that's not what's being voted on here. There are a ton of legal ramifications that could be coming that could come down the line. If I'm going to say anything critical about the situation, Mr. Manka didn't have to hand in his letter of resignation if there was something going fishy going on behind the scenes that if, uh, that would uh, imply impl, that would not in any way implicate Mr. Manka in a negative light, right? So there are a lot of th steps that are in place to protect him. It isn't necessarily necessary for him to have submitted that letter of resignation if there's something going on behind the scenes. And again, this none of this is really the case if if it's just a matter of the contract not being renewed. And just so folks know, one more year is what Mr. Mankin would have needed for tenure. So following up on that, what if there is a reason for for-cause termination? What if what's going behind the scenes? Now, I, I told you, like, this could be anything from as innocuous as, hey, I was made an offer I couldn't refuse in another district, right? Or, you know, my family's moving to Stanford because my wife I can't stand the commute, and it's just, it's just going to be easier for me to work in Stanford than it is to, to have to make the commute myself. And we just, we're, as a family, we're sick and tired of the driving. We both want to be home at a reasonable hour to be with the kids. It could be something as innocuous as that, or it could be something... Like a tr an automatic fire offense. I'm sure you can think of things in, at home. Everyone here can think of something that would be just an automatically fireable offense. But with tenure, not only does this does the union representation and the laws that surround all of this make it virtually impossible to fire him for cause. Once once he has tenure, now that virtually impossible goes on the books, and then it's virtually impossible to fire him for cause. And I'm not saying that he necessarily should be, but there are a lot of considerations to be made here if we knew what was going on, and we don't, and we don't, and we probably never know, will know, will know why, especially now, and as I've said, that's probably not a bad thing. This is probably not the end of all of this, but everything I've said Everything that, that Tammy said, everything that Eric said, this is basically all Pete Helmus was getting at before the crowd jumped in in the middle of the meeting and jumped down his throat. And again, I'm going to show you the whole clip. This clip goes st straight to the recess. So I'm not cutting anything out. This clip goes right to the end of what's available online. Here's what took place, folks. This is a, a highly unusual situation we face tonight. I'm struck by the fact that many people think that uh, the board has more information uh, than the public. These are they private don't. matters um, for Mr. Manka. Uh, Mr. Manka has has uh, affected his resignation, and who are we to agree with or disagree with an adult? He has his reasons. Mr. Manka could have also come here tonight and rescinded his his resignation, knowing the outpouring of love that that the, clearly the students. Had. <laughs> So before all of that initial clapping, yelling, and cheering, somebody threw in the crowd yelled out Mr. Ma something along the lines of, Mr. Manka's here, why don't you ask him? And then I guess Mr. Manka stood up and the crowd went bananas. Again, the meeting is there to conduct the business of the Board of Education and nothing else, nothing else. And if anything takes place that is out of order when it comes to Mr. Manka's employment, there are a, there's a, a tidal wave, 
tidal wave of securities for him that are in place, especially coming from the union, one of the strongest unions on earth, right? So he is taken care of. He is taken care of no matter how out of line the Board of Education gets. And again, this is the Board of Education's meeting. Yes, it's a meeting of public officials, but you don't get to, to do anything you want. The Board of Education controlling time, manner, and place, saying if you have public comment that you want to bring to us, please come bring it forth during public comment, right? There's a reason for that. It's the same reason that Board of Ed members aren't allowed to jump around the agenda and talk about 10 different things at the same time. Otherwise, the meeting becomes undoable. It becomes a complete... It just it's, it becomes impossible to, to, to run. And that's true of not only government meetings, it's true of Lions Club meetings or VFW meetings or VA meetings. It's, it's true of all of, you know, all of these local volunteer groups. It's true of all of those meetings when they, when they do things like adopt Robert's rules. There's a, a rule and procedure, and there's a reason that all of this takes place. There's a reason why courtroom proceedings have an explicit procedure that they follow. You don't just go straight into witness testimony. You have opening clo- uh, opening uh, uh, comments, or you have opening statements. You don't just go straight into letting the jury decide. No, you have the actual trial. You have an order of operations for all of this. And again, some of this is to protect free speech. And no, it is not appropriate in that case for the crowd to go hooting and hollering and call a recess, right? Like you, you. There's a way to hijack a meeting, and I'll get into it in a minute when we talk about the town council because it's a lot easier to execute at a town council meeting because of the rules of the town council meeting. But this isn't the way to do it. This this is not following the procedure, and those procedures are there for a reason, and they're good. They're good reasons. They're good reasons. And again, if if you don't like what's being said, civility requires civility. I'm sorry. Like the petition is there, and if you guys want to go outside of the uh, uh, board of ed and do something else that's a different conversation to be had. That's a different conversation to be had. But the, 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 the recess was called because there was hooting and hollering and we needed to get people to calm down. And, and this meeting's going to drag on even further. So folks have been asking what happened during the recess. I have it on really good account that Superintendent DeCorpo, uh, Mr. Manka's union rep, the Board of Education attorney who had to be there that night, Chairman Wendy Fallenbach and Mr. Manka got into a meeting and talked about procedurally what was allowed and what could be allowed. And again, there's a lot of procedure that has to be adhered to, which is why prior to all of this, there was a bunch of procedural, boring procedural back and forth to make sure everyone's proverbial ass was covered. And first timers, this is how it goes. Deal with it. Deal with it. These are, again, under normal circumstances, these are incredibly boring meetings. But after all that, and a return from Mr. Recess, uh, and turn from recess, what the board had to do was uh, make an amendment to the agenda. So they had to withdraw the existing second and the existing motion, and make an ad- amendment to the agenda, which you can only do with a two-thirds majority. So they had to have two-thirds of the board voting in favor of the amendment to add an item to the agenda, which is simply to allow Mr. Manka to make a statement to the board of, to the board of education. And for the record, this is what, this is what Pete, what Pete was hinting at. Like, it seems to me like Pete was, Pete was subtly being like, Hey, Mr. Manka, if you want to rescind your, your, your resignation, you can do that. Right. That's, that's to me how I read all of this. Right. So, so Pete was in no way out of line to say what he was saying. And in fact, may have, may have been actually giving the crowd what they wanted in the first place by subtly hinting at the fact that Mr. Manka could make a statement here and unilaterally res- rescind his resignation. And, you know, the, the powers that be that have, that were in that quick meeting, uh, to, to take, to hash out the procedural and the legal side of all of this. Apparently, that's what Mr. Maker can do, is just completely unilaterally rescind the contract. Um, and after all of the hubbub, after the return from re- recess, Mr. Maker does that. And as Wendy explains in this next clip, that's procedurally all there is. The unilateral rescinding is legitimate. And since everyone seems to have really liked that moment, here's that moment. The floor is yours. If you'd like to give a statement to the board, please. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity, Superintendent DeCorpo, um, Chairperson Fallenbach, and all the board members. Um, I'd like to thank the support of school and staff, the members of the community who joined us here tonight. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to officially uh, rescind my resignation. <laughs>
mistaken. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. At this point, there is no further action, and that resignation has been rescinded based on your statement. This it was not Jerry Springer, folks. Like, I get it. I get it. Can we please not have our public, public meetings turn into Jerry Springer? Can we please not be the audience of a Jerry Springer show? I don't think civility in that meeting. I don't think allowing, again, a formal governmental body, just like a courtroom, to function as a courtroom, as a courtroom would in the courtroom setting, I don't think there's, that's completely out of line to ask for. And that's basically all that the board was trying to get done. They, yes, there were 300 people in the room. You address the Board of Education when you speak to public comment. And Wendy gives you guys three minutes, which, and just about infinite, infinite speakers. So in the case of the Board of Ed, the chair has some discretion when it comes to public comment in these meetings. And there's no reason this recess had to happen. All 300 of you could have gone to the podium, right? Uh, all 300 of you could have gone to the podium and had it made 300 to one, one way. And again, the union rep is the union rep. So the union rep is allowed certain, uh, allowed to do certain things that you and I aren't because they're the union rep. They could just whisper into the board of education's attorney, uh, you know, into their ear and just say, you know, Mr. Mank wants to rescind. He has a comment he wants to make. Just, uh, and then the attorney would raise his hand. The chair would call on the attorney and the attorney would say something along the lines of, Mr. Manka would like to make a statement, and I guarantee you he would have gotten his time. I guarantee it. I absolutely guarantee Ms. Ms. Fallenbach would have said something along the lines of, okay, well, if we would like as a board to amend the agenda to allow Mr. Manka to make a comment, we would simply need to, re to uh, retract it. The, Pete, Pete Hummels would need to retract his second. Olga would need to re retract uh, uh, her motion, and then we make a new motion to modify to to amend the agenda you amend the agenda this is this is what took place this is what took place we didn't need the recess to take place and remember folks these are our neighbors do things by the book and i guarantee you you will have your time and that i that folks is something that is going to come up again and it's it segues naturally to the town council meeting where well, like I said, these are our neighbors. If you do things by the book, you will have your time, just like I did at town council, where they have a lot less discretion at, at town council when it comes to public comment. They have to give you your five minutes. They can't, the chair, there's, the chair can't say, you know what, there's a lot of people in the room, we're going to reduce that to three minutes. They have to give you your five minutes. They have to let anyone who signs up, who signs up in advance to speak, they have to let you speak. They have to. You don't have to speak toward any agenda item, right? You could just go up there with Moby Dick, open up page one and say, I'm going to read five minutes to the Board of Ed, or sorry, to the Town Council from Moby Dick. I hope to God if you guys are going to do that. If you guys are going to hijack the meeting, and I told you there's an appropriate way to do it. This is how you do it at a Town Council meeting. You get like, uh, if there's an issue that's seriously that contentious, you get 100 people in the room and you all just cycle through five minutes of Moby Dick. You say, Jim Smith, 123 Main Street, you know, and then you open up Moby Dick. Call me Ishmael. And you do five minutes and you leave a bookmark in there so everybody knows where to fall up to leave off. And unlike the Board of Ed, they can't establish a time limit for the item agenda, which is public comment. Which means that they can just do, that, that if you get 100 people in the room speak, spending five minutes, all five minutes reading from Moby Dick, that's 500 minutes. That's over six hours of public comment. The meeting is set to close, at, these meetings are set to close at 1030 and you have to make a motion to extend the length of the meeting, and that motion has to include either a time at which the meeting would, a new time for the meeting to close, or an amount of time by which you're going to extend it, which is basically the same thing. And I guarantee you, if Joe Fiella says, I'm just, sorry, Joe, I'm just picking out a name, uh, motion to extend the meeting from 1030 to 11 o'clock, motion passes. If he, if he just keeps doing that, 1030, 1130, 12 o'clock, they're gonna stop. They're, these are volunteers. And they have jobs and they have lives and they just want to go and they're going to want to go home, right? And that's how you take it. That's, that's how you completely take over a meeting. In the case of myself, I also used my five minutes. And as you guys know, I used my five minutes to talk about their Chernisky Road Bridge, which we've been talking about on this show forever. And we shouldn't have to, but we are. Uh, but in this case, what I used my five minutes for was a complete evisceration of process an excoriation of the bad faith action, and a brilliant, if I may say so myself, debunking of dumb claims. You're allowed to do that. 
In those five minutes, you come prepared. You come with a speech. You come with notes written down. You pay attention during the meeting. You write notes during the meeting, just like I do. And man, you can rail, you can rail your opposition. You can really make folks look stupid during public comment. And that's the appropriate way of doing it. And when it comes to the topic at hand, uh, you know, the Chernisky Road Bridge Project, huh, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I have a question. One more question. Policy of the squeakiest wheel getting the grease should come to an end tonight. Of course, I'm referring to the Chernisky Road Bridge Project, which won't break ground until next year and will wind up costing us hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, of taxpayer money, more than it would have if, if the engineers and directors at DPW were allowed to do their job and complete the bridge years ago as would have been the case if not for nonstop interference into, into the pedantic minutia of day-to-day -day engineering and design decisions of the Department of Public Works and by a very tiny handful of people. If nothing else, you should ask yourselves when it comes to this subject, who didn't come to these meetings? The answer is 28,000 people minus five or six in Milford residents. I'm the biggest proponent of rule by consent of the governed. I'm also a fan of running things like DPW like a business, which means adhering to the proper duties of this body as it relates to the ongoing operations of DPW. In short, proper management in the face of nitpicking micromanagement. As Ms. Francis alluded to at the last meeting, the job of the town council is to make enterprise level <coughs> decisions and to either trust or not trust the director of operations to execute those enterprise level decisions and not to make those decisions themselves. In short, the job of the town council is to either trust the decisions of the DPW director to ensure projects get completed in a reasonable time and not with an exorbitant cost to the taxpayers who foot that bill or to fire the director. For the record, I've yet to see any reason to argue for DPW Director Jack Healy's termination. In fact, the man should be lauded for, his, for the patience he's shown throughout this process. In this case, the consent of the governed comes from the trust we instill our elected officials with every November, a point made especially through this past November, which produced a statement election. We elect town council members ostensibly, at least, based on our trust through their value judgment. And tonight is a perfect example of how that value judgment may be exhibited because you take on these issues ad hoc. And that's because tonight we need a decision. And it's not just because not giving those instructions tonight will wind up costing the Milford taxpayers hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in grants whose application is due essentially Friday. There's also the precedent that will be set. Will we continue to be okay with this level of interference? Are we okay with spending hundreds of thousands of dollars that belong to 28,000 people to kowtow to the whims of five or six people? And more importantly, the never-ending goalpost moving they presented and the spurious, spurious and endlessly debunked arguments they presented in utter antagonism to the notions of proper governance. The majority here tonight were elected to act on reason and reason alone. Because there are people here who for some reason still subscribe to the idea that the squeakiest wheel should get the grease, I put together a petition, as some of you have seen, to show at least equal opposition to the demands of said five or six. There's also an online version that has roughly the same number of signatories. More importantly, hopefully, this two-week and part-time effort of mine will showcase the continued support from this community of the valued judgment of those officials we elected just last November. Please end this charade. Please instruct EPW Director Jack Healy to procure a design for a two-lane bridge which will, cut, which will save hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of the 28,000 people's money. With a box culvert foundation, if possible, please stop wasting what is both the time and money of 28,000 New Milford residents and taxpayers, and please establish here tonight the precedent that we will never do this again. Again, more than half a decade and we still haven't broken ground on what's gonna cost probably $2 million. We're all definitely gonna be over a million and a half at this point for an 18 foot long bridge. Please stop wasting what is both the time and money of the 28,000 New Milford residents and taxpayers and please establish here tonight the precedent that we will never do this again. Please allow the good folks at DPW to do their damn jobs and to build a damn bridge. First things first, we've gone over the scenic road violation with Randy DiBella who explained that there hasn't been a proposal. There hasn't been an actual design presentation yet. So there's no way to have violated the laws that, were, that were, relate to that. Two-lane bridge will save taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. That's a real point to make. And you have a duty to the taxpayers to not spend infinity, infinity of their dollars on projects like these. 
When it comes to speeding, you don't resolve the concerns of safety associated with speeding with more danger. The reason people slow down for a one-lane bridge is because it's more dangerous than a two-lane bridge. Obviously, two-ton hunks of steel going in opposite directions on the same lane is more dangerous than a two-lane bridge where they're not doing it, which is why the state won't, doesn't want to get involved with a, with a one-lane bridge. Mike, we need to wrap up. Wrap, wrap up. Okay, that's enough. Thanks, guys. And when it comes to anything more than that, <clears throat> as I was told, as I was told to, to uh, when it comes to anything more than that, if I want to say anything more than that, I have my show. I can talk about this. I can talk about this for weeks on end, for hours at a time, like I do. Right? And for any, I have my show. And in their meeting, at that meeting, right? In that meeting, there are rules that have been adopted, right? And I shouldn't call it their meeting, right? Because it is our meeting, but there are rules that we as a community have agreed to that, that are specific to that meeting, right? Here, here, I have my own rules, and they're way, way more relaxed than what is a, a formal setting. This is, as you can see, not a formal setting. As everyone has seen, this is not that formal setting. And when it comes to dumb commentary, right, you, if you're going to make dumb commentary, you then have to accept the consequences for that dumb commentary like I do in my show. If I say something stupid, I accept the consequences for saying something stupid. If somebody else has their own podcast, they can do that and say, look at the stupid thing Mike said. And again, this show and me capturing dumb commentary and relating it to the public, this is, how, this is part of how we hold our, our public officials accountable. And since you guys love, just as much as I do, dumb commentary from our elected officials, again, just as much as I do, hit it, Mary Jane. Um, I have a question. Just one more question. I would like a firm answer from Greg Ossipal as to what this is going to cost each taxpayer. I, I reached out to um, the tax collector, Nancy McGavick, and um, she doesn't have the numbers off the top of her head. I would have to of know how doesn't. many bills she sends out and divide that number into the the dollar amount we're talking about. Um, we'll probably get you the answer at a, you know, a later time unless you can come up with a, a definitive answer. Like, of course he doesn't have that answer in that meeting. And that's not, and, and there's a reason he doesn't have that, that answer. It's because it's totally irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. The point is that there's, that you, you have a duty to not blow hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of money that isn't your money. And I don't care how many people you had to steal that money from. If there was one person in town, if there were a hundred thousand people in town, I don't care. I don't care. You have a duty to that, to that, to that, to the spirit of representative government to not waste their money, even if it's a dollar. And of course, Greg Ossipal isn't going to have that, that answer right then and there. Not only would he have to find out not just the number of, of people in town, he would have to find out the number of tax bills in town. And then you'd have to do all kinds of independent variable control because that isn't going to give you the answer that's actually going to tell you what folks are paying on average. That this is going to cost folks on average per year because it is per year in terms of the direct expenses it relates to because it's going to get bonded too. This is going to complicate things even further. If you, if we have to spend an extra several hundred thousand dollars, if not millions of dollars, it's not just going to come out of a fund. It's not just like we have this money laying around. It's going to come out of a bonded item. So this is a completely impossible question for Greg to answer, especially because it, when it comes to the tax bills themselves, how many of these tax bills are renters who are only paying property tax on their vehicles? And the way that they pay their property tax is by paying rent to the landlord who then makes a payment to the town of New Milford for their for the property tax on the physical facility or on the land underneath underneath that physical facility if it isn't a condo. So this is so so, so there's going to be this like bifurcation of tax bills where 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 this huge section of people are only paying a few hundred bucks a year and then there's this huge section of people that are paying a few thousand dollars a year and not a whole lot in between. You're going to have basically, you know, if it, if it's 50-50 it's 50-50, if it's 30-70 it's 30-70. But it's not going to be like 1 in 99, right? And speaking of 1 in 99, do you want to use a mean? Because the mean isn't going to tell you something like what a median would tell you. Because I can guarantee you in town, there are, there's Diane Van Furstenberg, who I can assure you is paying 10 times the tax bill of the next 
eight highest taxpayers in time in town and that's going to shift everything so we're not actually getting a useful picture uh, and we're not getting what the average tax bill is as a result of that so this is such a complicated question to answer in addition to the fact it's a completely useless question to answer and the and the result that you're going to produce isn't going to actually address the issue here which is wasteful spending if you're willing to wastefully spend x dollars uh, per uh, per person per project, why not waste X dollars per person per project on everything? You have a duty not to blow this money. Uh, but, uh, fortunately, the council members were there to kind of point that point that out and kind of allude to that fact at least. But again, we're if we're going to debunk one stupid idea. We now have to pivot to well, this wonderful what aboutism. Well, you know what? We spent millions of dollars on a turf field, you know, and there there wasn't any big hoo ha over that. And you know, we're asking for a bridge. Yes, that's there was be, um, to fit the scenic the road ordinance voted. and also um, <laughs> be a safety issue. Um, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's an eighteen foot bridge. You're, you're talking about comparing an 18-foot bridge to rebuilding an entire athletic facility f in terms of its turf and its grounds. Like, of course one project is going to be way, 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 way more expensive and way, 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 way more involved than the other. Never mind the fact that one is a goddamned bridge. Like, there's not so much to modify about a bridge. You have to get, it serves a strictly utilitarian purpose. Get car over river. Done. Done. And, and for that reason, there's only a handful of ways to get car over river. When there's 8 billion concerns and 8 billion interests to look into when it comes to a turf field, which is why you delegate that to a committee. Especially since the project, you know going into it's going to be millions of dollars because of the nature of the thing. You don't know going into an 18-foot bridge that it's going to cost you millions of dollars. If we were talking about completely redesigning Bridge Street in conjuncture with the state so that we could effectively have two adjacent bridges instead of Veterans Bridge where you have two lanes going one direction and two lanes going the other direction across that bridge, you're going to have to modify the hell out of Route 7, out of that bridge structure, out of Bridge Street. You're going to have to have all kinds of temporary, extremely expensive temporary structures taking place. You're going across a much larger span of a much more of high volume river with all kinds of pollution that's already in it that we know about. You, we, we know that there are certain animal species that in terms of the environmental concerns are going to raise all kinds of questions. What we're talking about here is an 18 foot bridge. We're not talking about a 25 year project because it's going to take a quarter of a century to take on a project like what I just intimated to replace the veterans bridge. And it's going to cost a kajillion, bazillion, jillion, billion dollars. And we know that going in, it's going to cost infinity dollars. If the town and the state have to coordinate together to replace that bridge in the manner I just described. But after all of the stupidity and nonsense we've had to deal with, with this, this, utterly ridiculous topic we the, the thing finally got voted on and yes folks the vote was over all it was over was whether or not jack he, jack should submit uh jack Healy should submit a two-lane bridge design versus a one-lane bridge design and yes during my public comment i'll admit it because i'm a good faith actor folks who aren't willing to admit when they're wrong and you know who you are good faith actor Yes, I was wrong about the due date of the grant application for this date when it comes to this project because that extension was offered at the end of the previous week. And the only one in the room that knew about it was Jack Healy because it hadn't been released to the public. But again, this thing finally got voted on and I really hope that's all we have to talk about it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Any abstentions? Opposed. Okay. Opposed. Okay. And of course, that's how that vote went. Of course, that's how that vote went. And that's it. That's it. I really hope that's all. We, we don't have to go any, any further than this. I really don't want to have to continue to talk about a goddamn 18-foot-long bridge. 
not at town council, not at my show, but thank God I get to talk about these sort of things on my show. Now our elected officials, who again, are our government representatives. The difference between the private sector and the public sector is the proverbial gun. Now they know if they say something stupid, I'm showing it to the world on my show. Not at a town council meeting, by the way, because Taylor Media, when I run, when I run the broadcast for these meetings, Taylor Media is not TMZ. I know you guys want it to be, but this is the nature of my business, this is the nature of my job. You want, if, if, if you are going to come into a town council meeting and try to hijack the meeting out of order by acting out of order, no. Sorry, Taylor Media isn't TMZ. I'm not giving you time of day. I am there to record the business of the town council. And that's it. And everyone who's in there, you all have phones. And what you can do is hold your phone horizontally and go ahead and camera it and videotape it. Go ahead and put it out to Facebook. And I, I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm saying that like it is within all of your powers to do that. It is within the power of anyone in the room to do that. I don't know what the legality is in the matter. That's for you guys to figure out. But again, you all have phones. I have a job. It's a formal governmental meeting setting. And I, Taylor Media is never going to be TMZ. I've talked about this with the attorney. I've talked about this with the mayor. We have a, and I agree with the decision on this matter. When there is an outburst, I focus the camera on the mayor. I turn off all the microphones except for the mayors. It's happened in the past. I hope to God it doesn't happen again, but... We're prepared to, have to do it, to do it in, the, in the future. It happened a few weeks ago when that homeless lady came up and, and wanted to speak during public comment but didn't want to be on camera and didn't want to give a real name and didn't want to give a real address and she was told, listen, there's, there, this meeting has rules. Deal with it. And you know what? The camera was focused on Mayor Bass. All the other microphones were turned off. The business of the meeting was not really being conducted so we're not fi- I'm not giving somebody a, a camera and a microphone in, the, in those settings. If you want to be on camera, if you want to have a microphone, there's public comment. You get five minutes to say just about anything you want. Show up a few minutes before the meeting, sign up on the list, and you get to say just about anything as long as you're actually addressing the board of the town council. Again, the town council meeting it ha- it has much stricter rules on public comment than the board of education. And again, I've talked about these outbursts happening in the past. It happened last week. Before we get about, before we get into this, the reason I, I don't want to discuss this is because this whole, this this whole interrupting these meetings like this, it's just it's gotten me so frustrated that I just I just don't want to deal with it. I just like especially after what happened on Tuesday night. If this is this if this is what this, the spirit of the town is going to be, a complete rejection of civility, I'm I'm just done with it. I just don't want to talk about it. It frustrates the hell out of me that these things are happening, and that's why I don't want to talk about it. But you guys, I absolutely bombarded me. I suppose I in some way at least do this show for you guys. So we will talk about it in very, in very brief and in very limited terms. But most importantly, the who, what, when, or why. What happened? Because, you know, I guess in fairness, if you guys have questions about a town council meeting, just as far as the who, what, when, or why. All right. All right. So before the outburst happened, we need to get into into what is going on here. We need to set everything up so people understand what's going on about this. This was this uh, this whole thing took place during the pre the during the agenda item that was related to the ARPA request for farmers and uh, farmers education, etc. We've talked about this on the show. There's two ways to say no to this, right? There's two ways to say no to this. We did an entire episode of. Like what the appropriate way to say no to this is and why I would say no. And those two reasons, those two rationales for saying no are mine, the libertarian response, which is I would vote no to basically all of the ARPA funds for the reasons that I've beaten to death on this show so I don't need to repeat myself. And two, the Tony Van Grove, uh, the Tony Van Grove rationale. We, we showed his public comment. We went into great detail about what that was just last week. There's a way to say no to this and yes to other things. And it's the Tony Van Grove way to do it. And the exact wrong way to do this, which is what we spent the entire first show on when we talked about this, you don't do it because Joe Q is the presenter and he's not a real farmer. You don't do that. I've given you guys the out. I've given you two ways to say no to this. I've given you two, two outs, right? You, 
The one, the one you can't use is Joe Q isn't a farmer and he's the one presenting this. So we're just going to say no because Joe Q, right? Uh, say what you will about the man. I won't. That's, that's the wrong reason to, to say no to this. And so folks understand this, uh, this outburst resulted from Tom Esposito's comments immediately leading up to that. So folks understand what his arguments are. And again, I talked about my, my re- rationales for saying no. And I talked about the, the Tony Vengrove rationale for saying no. And they're two different rationales. Both are acceptable. You guys now have the information before you. If you follow along at all, uh, basically Tony Vengrove's uh, uh, um, rationale was this thing is just too simply too broad the way it's presented, the way it's rented, uh, written. It need, we would need a lot more information or we would need much greater specificity. Both of these things can be achieved. Here's Tom Esposito's argument. Here we we have to set this up. Here is the context that Tom Esposito provides for the arguments he make for the statements he makes later on in in the meeting. The proposal that's on the table though here, and I am in favor of organic farming, lack elimination of pesticides and all of these wonderful things. But we're talking about a request from a group that I really don't know that's not one of the trusted nonprofits or agencies that we have funded over the last year and a half. I have no set plan on where the money is going. And if you're telling me that we're going to overcome pe- bad pesticides with $150,000, I'm, I'm going to laugh because it's, there's, there's not enough money that we can put out there in any budget the next five years that's going to overcome some of the bigger issues that we're talking about. You have to add like five zeros to that number to get to where you want to go to fix this. Okay, I'm all in favor of it. Okay, I, I, I get it. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a conservation guy. I get it. Right? But $150,000 is going where? And to who? And why? We established eight, X amount of millions of dollars to groups that we've had a very, very long history with that put a plan in front of us. Not just, I want to get into organic farming or I need some education. This is not seed money for people that want to start businesses. The Economic Development Corporation is there. The, the USDA is there. There's micro loans for people who want to get into business. I'm an entrepreneur. I support that. Okay, I'll come and buy this stuff from your farm. All right, but this is, this is, these are not the funds for this particular you know, broad stroke we're going to save the planet and save farming mission. I'm sorry. It, it's, 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 a, it's literally an eyedropper in Candlewood Lake. It's a drop of water in an ocean that we're asking for 150000 And we've been talking about this for I don't know how many months and had multiple presentations and we've been going through this. I think we have to bring this thing to a conclusion here tonight, whether we're going to go forward or we're going to stop this. I, I'm going to vote in favor of stopping this tonight. I think this should be the last and final discussion. Let's make a vote. We've talked at this thing ad nauseum. We understand all the benefits. But the reality is $150,000 is not going to do it, and it's not our charge to take this money and help seed new businesses. That's not, that's not our charge here. True or untrue, that was what his commentary was. And we're not, I'm not, I'm not going to in- inject any opinion on all that. Now you guys have the context, and that was the thing that led into the, the famous outburst from last Monday night, which you guys have seen. That's what led into this. And for the record, there really is nothing more than what happened in this two minutes. I, I, I know you guys want something more interesting. It's not. So I, I don't disagree with bringing farmland in, but they don't also aren't an authoritative I body or an or, or I don't think either. we bring them and in. I don't think we we don't need to. Part. The fact Let's here is we've got a proposal on the table for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's telling us, or at least one hundred and fifty yes. grand, that a request for ARPA funds, that we're going to save the entire world and create an entire money. mecca of organic or organic farming here in New Milford on one hundred and fifty thousand dollars seed money for new organic farmers. That's what you're telling me. These are people that are not I, in the I business. Telling you that. Uh, excuse me, you're not here. You're really not here to speak. We're not, but we're not telling you. Excuse me, Mr. Garanda, this is not a meeting for you. As the sergeant of arms, I can ask you to leave. If I, if I call the cops on you now, they're going to take you out of the room. As the sergeant of arms, as the sergeant of arms, please leave the room. As the sergeant.
for months on a charade of people that I have no, no trust for, no trust. Mr. Mr. Caranta, if I were you, if I were you, I'd get out of the building before the police come here and ask you to leave. Okay. We're going to call, yeah, recess. I'm calling for a five minute recess. Okay. Five minute recess. Leave the room. We can all calm down. Leave the room. Mr. Russo, just take a recess. No. We're going to call yeah, right the now we're just doing a five no more discussions on this. Yes. Five minute recess. Yes. 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 Just five minutes in a row. Five minutes. We're done with this. I'm done. Um, we're just doing a recess so everybody. Mr. Russo. Mr. Russo. We're just, we're just doing a recess so everybody can just be calm. Yes. That's all. And then we went into recess. And that's all there was to it. That's, that's really all there was to it. Yes, Tom, so folks understand, during the recess, yes, Tom did call the police. I believe they came. I honestly know they didn't come actually into the T.D. Paul Martin room. The whole commotion lasted just two minutes, and that was it. Joe went out in the hallway to, out, he went out in the hallway outside the room during the recess, was visibly angry, and then just left a minute later. And that's, that's all there is to it. I don't believe the police even got there before he left. And again, that's all there is to it. Was it petty of Tom to so quickly go to the police? As a free speech absolutist, yeah, probably. Would he have done so so quickly if it was, let's say, the AGs? Yeah, probably not. But this is the risk you accept when you conduct civil disobedience. The reason it's called civil disobedience is because you're disobeying the law civilly. And if you're going to disobey the law civilly, then that requires that you accept the consequences of your action, which may be that Tom Mesposito may call the police on you. And it's up to his discretion when, as to when he calls the police. And you know what? Like, maybe he pulls the trigger faster for certain people than other people. But the point is you did speak out of line and again, these are the consequences that you accept when it comes to this sort of thing. And again, we've had these in the past and the re I have to bring this up because you guys have been jumping down my throat. When it came to Lisa Agee on this show, we talked about it within the context of a pre-established good standing of character remaining consistent on principle. That was the context that we brought that up. In fact, I was joking during that, that during that conversation. I was taking it extremely very heartily about the fact that Lisa was the one actually jumping into jumping out uh, and not Rick, who. So I thought that was kind of comically out of character in a certain way. And I explicitly said it was like a two out of ten. Like she said her thing, she sat down. I believe it was like five words, and then she sat down. And, you know, sorry, folks, I, I've been out of town this weekend. It's part of why we're watching this on the crappy camera and not the good one. I, I didn't have time to go get you guys the clip to, sh to evidence, to show my receipts. But again, I, 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 when we talked about it, when it came to the, to the ages, I said two out of 10, this isn't that, it, it, there isn't much to talk about here. And I gave you the context that I, I brought that up in. But unfortunately, I, I, quite frankly, if this is how the community is just going to treat this whole situation, then I'm done. I'm just not covering it. Period. Period. If you guys are going to just go to these board of ed meetings and town council meetings and then just start yelling, I don't care who's doing it. I'm not covering it anymore. This is the last time we're ever doing this again. But uh, th There's a reason there are certain people in this town I don't give any coverage to. Uh, there, are, there, there are spats that I get into with certain people in, on Facebook that, or that I at least used to get into. You guys are all aware of those spats that I've had. And there's a reason I don't drop their names. There's a reason I don't give them any more attention than I 
care to give them. And if this, if the community is going to continue to treat these, these, these meetings the way that they've been treating them over the past few weeks and over the past few months and, and as well, I'm just done. I'm not giving it any coverage. We're going to talk about the boring procedural stuff. And if you guys bombard my phone with, why won't you talk about, you know, uh, Jim Smith, uh, you know, he was, he was yelling something in the middle of a meeting. Why, what did he say? I don't know. I don't care. I don't know. I don't care. I'm not talking about it anymore. Right? I'm just done. I'm done covering it. I talked about at the beginning of the show. If the community is going to, to reject civility and just adopt a principle of incivility, then if you want to be a genie, you got it. And the response I'm going to give you is incivility. If you want incivility, I'll give you incivility. And otherwise, I'm just, I'm not covering it. I'm not doing this anymore. I really hope we don't have to ever cover this again. And quite frankly, I'm probably not going to ever again. I'm, I'm very aware that restraint in these moments is difficult. Alicia DeCorpo had to sit there and take it. And she did. She could have jumped up. And, and this could have turned into throw chairing Jerry. Jer chair throwing Jerry. 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 It didn't. It didn't. You know why it didn't turn into that? Because she sat there and she took it. And for all of whatever faults she might have, in the moment, she sat there and she took it and she took it with a smile. And I'm sorry, but that's, that's more of a sign of character than a lot of other people in the room in, 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 these, in these certain cases when it comes to just sitting there and taking it. And, and I sympathize her because in that town council meeting, I had to sit there and take it. There, there was, at the end of the meeting, there was an obvious partisan hit job and a complete rejection of the no notions of free speech and, it, and, and a much more overt and severe manner too. Overtly false statements were being made about myself, my character, and my business. And hopefully it doesn't result in the loss of business or result in real damages. And there's a reason I phrase things that way. But so folks understand the context. They were, the, the town council amended the agenda so three women in the room could come after yours truly. And if you want to know what I mean by come after yours truly, well, here's Hillary offering the rationale. It's been a brutal night, so I'm pretty beaten up to get into this right now. But I think that the problem that I'm hearing from some residents is that um, it's intimidating to come speak and be videoed from lots of angles and then have it be spread all mm -hmm. over social media on a, on the videographer also has a big social platform social media platform so the question is I think it's a great service that these meetings are recorded and everyone can watch them later live you know it's a great service and he does it very well the question is then you know the town owns that video, right? And so it's not really um, fair that it then gets spun off into mm. a very... Um, so, yeah, but it's like a public domain. <laughs> My big social media platform. If Ray is even watching, thanks for watching, Ray. If Pat's actually watching, thanks for watching, Pat. And the like four or five of you otherwise that are, are probably watching this live while it's airing. Thanks for watching. I'm so grateful for my audience of like eight, my big social media platform. Oh, by the way, folks, this is, this is actual free speech he's going after. This is actually going after somebody in the room who's not dis interrupting the meeting, who's not being disruptive of the meeting, who's not out of order in the meeting, who's doing their job when it comes to the filming of the, of, of the video, who's doing the thing that, they're, that you've asked them to do and is separately of his own volition in his own person completely separate from his business, not even using his business's camera tonight, not even doing any of that. This is actual free speech. My show, my show. That's, that's coming from my show, from the, from the seat of government. That's actually stepping on free speech. And for the, for the record, Hillary, not only is it fair, not only is it not unfair, not only is it full on fair, it's a good thing. The appropriate response to my show isn't smearing me at a meeting, but put out your own podcast. You're doing that right now, and we all know it. Put out your own podcast. I would love to see it. I, send me an invite to watch your podcast. I, I can't wait to see it, right? Put together your own thing. And you can come onto Facebook, and you can come onto YouTube, and you can download all of these videos, and you can use all of the Google... <laughs> Google... YouTube video downloader, right? Pop that in. Boom. First result that comes up. And just like any 10-year-old can do right now, go capture that video and then transform it. 
and transform it by talking about it on your podcast. If Mike Sinello says something stupid and you want to have a video on your, your, your channel that says Mike Sinello says something stupid and you want to talk, call me out for saying something stupid, wonderful, wonderful. I challenge you to do that. But that's the appropriate place for this. That's the appropriate place for this. And all of this, by the way, all, all of the video I'm using is obvious public domain, which means you can do whatever the hell you want with it for all intents and purposes, especially within the context of transformative, uh, of a transformative reproduction, right? And, you know, town attorney DeBella there, of course, to lay down the smackdown. So Randy, to answer Hillary's first, um, I don't want to call it a question, but just to, uh, you have something that's a recorded public document is that, is that protected? It's a public record. It is a public record, yeah. Under the definition of, of, of under Freedom of Information Act, Section 1-210, as a matter of fact, that becomes in and of itself a public record. So he can name the actual article, right? Like, that's... And, and that should be it when it comes to this conversation. If your town attorney, if this is such an easy and straightforward issue that your town attorney can jump, can name off the top of his head the actual item of the, of the agenda, that should be it and you deal with it. Remember too that we talk about oh, the people in the room are, are your neighbors. So am I. Hello. I, I, I'm a New Milford resident too, right? And your, your, your options are uh, admonishment and, and <laughs> you know what? I really shouldn't be spending too much time in this because they, they kind of have revealed that they have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, wanted to grab it and, sh yeah. and share it, they could do that they because it's... They, they well, can. It, yeah, I mean, you could admonish them. It's on, you like it's on YouTube every single meeting we have for the time. Yeah. But up. I think Not what, many people know how to just go in and record and take it and put it on Facebook, but right. this, the person who's doing the filming also has a whole social media... I mean... Not many... Again, you guys have talked... You guys have commented on these shows. Like... Children are doing this. Children are able to go. Anyone who has a Google machine can go into their Google machine and type in YouTube video downloader. That's what I do for, for the majority of these, for the majority of this content here. It is way less time to take a 30 gigabyte file that's on my laptop and some, and, and then transfer it onto a flash drive, which I then have to transfer onto my computer, which I then have to put into my video editor, which I then have to render or just Google, YouTube, video downloader, done. It's way less time to do it that way. And very often that's, that's the way I do things because it just makes more sense that way because any 10 year old can do that. And, 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 oh my God, conflict of interest. Okay. Then say it, Hillary, say it at the next town council meeting. Come on to my show and say it if you want to invitation to Hillary, come on to my show and talk about whatever you want, whenever you want. Calendar's wide open. I'll, I'll make time for that conversation. Conflict of interest, say the interest. Give me the two interests. Give me the two interests that are in conflict by recording these meetings and then talking about them. Am I, am I incapable of fairly doing my job by recording the meetings if I'm then going to talk about them later? How could that possibly be the case? Of course, I'm going to be recording the most relevant thing if the thing I'm then going, if I'm, what I'm going to be doing is talking about the thing because of the relevancy of the thing. Hader, that first things first is an express non-conflict of interest. In fact, it's actually making, it's actually forcing me to, to do my job even better, right? So that if I'm capturing it from YouTube, things like having those lower thirds makes it easier for me to do that. And also it makes it easier for you guys to watch at home. If it makes it easier for me to watch at home, it makes it easier for you to watch at home. If we want to talk about something like a conflict of interest, maybe it would be something like sitting on the board sitting on the, the, the subcommittee that's reviewing the applications and that's establishing a standard of, of acceptable price for a piece of property that's being sold by the town and then making a bid on it and having the, the, the secret knowledge that is what the, the, the committee, subcommittee that's in charge of the sale of certain pieces of property, let's say, having that knowledge of what the, the committee would be considered acceptable to submit to the higher authority and then putting, making a bid on that piece of property with that knowledge at hand, that would be, folks, an example of conflict of interest because your interest in buying the property is in direct conflict with your interest to serve the community by getting the highest price. You want to offer the lowest price. The community wants the highest price. These are directly conflicting interests. 
expressly and obviously so. So if you want a conflict of interest, I don't know if that's ever come up in this town, but that would be an example of one. And again, all, all you do is list the examples. But, you know, I, I shouldn't have to do this because it's Katie that winds up pointing out just how dumb this is. So we don't have to. You know, it's a bit of a conflict of interest. I think people are a bit, you know, <coughs> it's, a, it's a chilling effect to have people come to the town council and then be so really... So the use of the video yeah, so outside it's, of its know, intention, it's which is to provide information for the public, is what the issue is. Provide information for the public. Chilling effect of this. Chilling effect of this. That I'm providing information to the public. And hey, Katie, man, gotta, gotta appreciate, gotta appreciate, like, the just beautiful display of how unbelief, just perfect smackdown, perfect takedown, right? But of course, now we're gonna move the, the goalposts, and yeah, this chilling effect and that, that I have on by promoting to the public what's taking place versus the new strategy, which is to suggest that we should. That public partition shouldn't be recorded by video? Yeah, I mean, maybe edited. public participation that, shouldn't be recorded maybe. by video. Chilling effect? Which one is more chilling, hey, Hillary? And uh, uh, beyond that, I'm just going to say, you know, bold strategy, Cotton. Bold strategy, Cotton. Something about transparency you guys keep talking about, which is daylight. You guys aren't talking about transparency. The word you're looking for is daylight. And yeah, Randy DeBella tries to steal me on all of this before I get called a town employee. I think there's just Randy? a couple issues. The yeah. recording is fine. Yeah. I think if, if I'm incorrect, Hillary, tell me. <clears throat> I think what you're saying is it shouldn't be chopped up and used it for another reason on another media or through another medium uh, for political purposes. By the town employee. By the town employee. employee. Who's town filming it? That's, that's what <laughs> the concern is. Yeah. Yeah, and we all know why she's framing it that way. We all know why she's saying, by the, town, by the town employee. We have to specify that it's a town employee. Come on. We all know what's going on here, right? We all know the rules are different if, I want, if I'm the town employee versus just simply a contractor. And only a little tiny bit so, by the way. And, and, and you know, as Tom Esposito explains, even further, when it comes to the ownership all of, of all of this, it is obviously in the public domain, and anyone can do this. Thanks, Tom. The property, the actual film, or I should say video, I'm dating myself, um, is, pub is a public record. Right. So, if I'm so inclined, I could use it. You could use it, anyone can use it. Yeah, anybody can. But, yeah. Once and it hits YouTube, and, and you can suck. cut it up and slice it up and use it for any political message you want. Yeah. If so, they, and, if it's they, on, they, and it's on there right now. So okay. but if, as we're speaking, somebody could be doing this. This is 100% true. If you guys have the technological capacity to do it, you could screen capture, screen capture the meeting on YouTube as it's happening and be cutting it up and editing it as it's happening. And you, in fact, because it's full on public domain, you could just be simply live streaming it, have an overlay of your face and have you offering commentary and laughing and chuckling and having a good merry old time over the, over the meeting. As Tom explains, this is just plain public domain and there's... Nothing the government can do to stifle out this free speech. Again, government stifling out the free free speech of somebody not even in one of their meetings. Right? And, and DeBella then talks about slander protection, which I, I wish he would go in more into because it, there's a standard for what slander is. You have to be looking at the motive and intention in this case of, of the activity taking place. There has to be an actual mistruth state, misstatement, uh, uh, mistruth characterization or statement of fact. You have to know that it's the case. There has to be some actual damages. And of course, to meet the standard for actual slander, it has to actually be slander. Under the rules of defamation, defamation Randy DeBella doesn't do a very good job of explaining this. And honestly, he should probably go over this in greater detail at the next meeting. But they don't actually get necessarily get slander protection. From so someone if else. They, if they take a piece of video and they make something out of it for a, a, a different motive, and it doesn't elicit or doesn't show what the, the, the language was or what the, the item was, in order to, to uh, uh, by innuendo, slander somebody, that's act that they're not protected. They've used that piece, but they're still not protected 
under the law of defamation if they slander somebody. And it would be slandering a person, not the body in this case. Of course, you're allowed to full on slander a governmental body outside of those meetings. And again, talking about people in a, in a merely negative light is obviously not slander. Opinions are not slander. And you are a public official, which makes you a public figure, which means that standard is much higher. When it comes to other people in the room who are elected public officials, who are, for example, let's say the chair of the DTC. I don't know who it is anymore, but let's just say it's the chair of the DTC making unbelievably stupid public commentary. She's a public official, so the bar is much higher. And Randy wasn't giving the conditions for slander. He was giving the conditions that would allow for the separate charge of slander to actually be triggered. As in, there has to actually not only be a slander, but there has to also be these other things. You can't just say there are these other things, therefore. You have to have the actual slander. I wish Randy DeBell would go, more, go in greater, uh, greater detail on this, on this matter, especially when it comes to public officials and public figures. The standard for that is much, much higher. And as far as what he's talking about when it comes to making money, again, this is another place where Randy doesn't... It's, he's, not, he's not wrong. And I know, I know he knows the issue on this matter. He just doesn't do a great job of explaining this in the moment, probably because he was kind of dumped on... I mean, they had to amend the agenda to, to, to go ahead and, and spend God knows how long talking about what I say outside of these meetings, right? And let's, let's just paint this as in positive light as I can, right? Randy doesn't do a good job explaining this when it comes to the making money side of things. And I know this is the suit that's coming. I know they're going to come after me for, you're making money. Or tell, well, it's in some sort of order saying something along the lines of, you're not allowed to make money. No, what he's talking about is literally printing DVDs and saying, here's the town council meeting. Here's my creation of work. Unadulterated, unedited. And here it is. Buy it for $10. I wish you would do a better job of explaining this, but here we are. I know this is coming down the pike. And someone could not use these films, but this video what we, that we own, not to sell for them. the sake of making money off. No, no, they're not, they're not. Although they're not copyrightable, they're also not plagiarizable. So in other words, they're owned by the town of Milford. They're fair game for anybody. It's a public record under the Act, Freedom of Information Act. So every but they're not supposed to sell them. They can't sell them. It's not it's not their property. But what if they use them to increase the 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 viewership, of their, the viewership of their social media platform and increase the ad revenue. That's well, well, they can do that. They can put it on their, on their, right. their social. But I'm talking that. about so, chopping it up right. and selling. But I'm talking about chopping it up and selling it. So he's not talking. He's so Mike Nahum and Chris Cosgrove explicitly said basically what Mike's doing, and Randy was like, "No, no, they can do that. Mike can do that. What Mike can't do is again literally chop up these these." unadulterated, completely unedited, unaltered videos and saying, here's a town council meeting, it's mine, and therefore I'm going to sell it as though it were my intellectual property, which it's not. That's what he's talking about. And that's not what you guys come to this show for. You guys come for the transformative element. You guys come for the order that I put these clips in and the commentary that I add on top of that, right? Even the folks that, that, that hate watch, even my hate subs, which I'm grateful for. Thank you so much to the people that, that hate the show and for some reason still watch. I'm grateful for, the, for everyone who participates in the audience. Grateful for everyone who chimes in during Q&A. And that's what it's there for. And that's why we do this. This is already well-established law, by the way. And Sargon just won this case. This exact case. He just won this like three months ago. So this, this, I mean, this should be fairly wrapped up. And, and, and you know, Debella then goes on to explain the free speech side of this entire, this entire, I'll call it, call it that, charade. Now, having said that, the town needs to be very careful. An admonition is one thing, but you can't act to stifle speech because act. we're a governmental entity. And the First Amendment prohibition is, applies to us. It doesn't apply to... Dave Perry and Howard doesn't, doesn't apply to Kramer Nance. It applies to the town of the Milford. A governmental entity cannot stifle free speech. So if I get told expressly by this governmental body, by what Randy DeBella is saying, you can't have your show and also be our contractor, that would be the act. The act would be terminating me because of what I say here in these meetings. That would be the act. That would be an actual act, Right? Which means, as long as I'm not 
literally slandering the people in the room, which I'm obviously not. Again, you say dumb thing on video. I point to dumb thing on video. That's not me slandering you. That's you slandering yourself. He's He made the case here, right here. Like, this is where the free speech line is drawn. So, you know what? Best of luck with all this. <laughs> Mary Jane Lundgren, say my name, by the way, when it comes to litigation and, and with this dumb question that Randy DeBella answers, if, very frankly, <laughs> is obviously just no. So I have a question. Um, excuse me. Um, so if, if something is taken out of context and used on somebody else's, you know, social media platform, out of context. Um, does this leave the town open to uh, litigation? That's a great question. But, it, uh, and that's been, that's been handled but before. I the answer is no. Go ahead. No. The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no, Mary Jane. Uh, it, it, they, they're demonstrating that they just have no idea how this all works. Go ahead, Hillary. The videographer who gets all the video I'm looking all at the all meetings. The, okay. Right in his camera and his in his no. property and his possession goes home and chops them all up and makes great movies. Again, it's so it's, the, the question is at what point is it the town's property that if it's going to be everybody like he's not going to YouTube and downloading all those mm -hmm. pieces that he's using. Not only do they not know how free speech works, they don't know how any of this works. Like just last week, just last week, the file size was so massive that yes. I went to YouTube and that's exactly what I did. When it, when, it, when it came to the Board of Ed videos that you guys watched tonight, I went onto the Board of Ed's own website, went to, their, went to, to where you can get their videos and there's a download button and you download it. It's that straightforward. It's that straightforward. But of course, then, and then when you get called out for... Not understanding how all of this works, you have to move the goalposts. And of course, the goalposts move, well, not of course, but in this case, the goalposts move to safety. Sal, Sal, have fun with Alexander Thomas's comment here. I guess, hold on. The videographer who gets all the video, I'm looking all at the all meetings. Okay. Right. I'm, oh man, I'm sorry, guys. It's this video that we're looking for. Again, it would not be an episode of the Mike Snow Show without technical difficulties. So, anyways, this is Sal having fun with Alexander Thomas and her goalpost moving to safety. I want it to be safe for people who have something to say to want to come and say so, it. The unfortunate yes. part... Uh, who told you they're not safe? Hang, hang on. <laughs> who told you they're not safe? And I love the dismissive attitude about this because seriously... You're of the age, Alexander, where I, there's no way you did yourself use the phrase sticks and stones will hurt, will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I guarantee you've, ex you've used that exact phrase on either your children, your uh, children of your family members, your children's children. I guarantee you she's used this exact phrase before. And that's the, that's why you were getting this incredulous look from Sal, which I just love. I just absolutely love the complete dismissal here. Who is calling for, who feels unsafe because Mike Sinello has a podcast where he talks about stuff. Mike Sinello has a podcast where he talks about stuff. And, you know, there's a reason there's framings going on. We know why. We know why. It starts with S and rhymes with Lander. We know exactly what's going on here. We know exactly the partisan hit job that th that's going on here. Everyone can visibly see it. It's what's happening before our eyes. 1984, 1984, Right here, this book, especially in light of the, the recent, you know, creation of a literal ministry of truth, 1984 was supposed to be a warning against a dystopian future, not a goddamn instruction manual. How many times do I have to say this? Thank God, thank God there are Republicans in the room. Thank God there are people in the room who actually believe in free speech when it comes to all of this. And, you know, because I'm fair... And level-handed, the Republicans in the room did kind of get something wrong on when it comes to this matter. The, and, it, and the only thing they got wrong was that in some ways they've, they've kind of characterized the situation as somewhat unfortunate. 
It's unfortunate that the rules are written in this country such that Mike gets to have his show and also be the videographer. It's unfortunate that people are going to come to the podium and say what they're going to say in the middle of the meeting, that people who are elected officials are going to say what they're saying in the middle of this meeting and it's going to be recorded. And it's unfortunate that that means that because it's public domain, it's unfortunate that it's public domain and that therefore we have free speech and therefore Mike gets to talk about it on his show, even if, even if it's not in the most positive of lights. Which, again, too bad. You say something stupid. Me pointing to the stupid is not me, is not me doing anything wrong. And in fact, it's, it's, not, it's not only not unfortunate, it's a good damn thing. Like I, and, and quite frankly, I'm going to show you one final clip here before we wrap things up because we're way over on time and I don't care. I don't care. This is a show on free speech. We're going to spend as much time as we have to on this. Right? I'm not even sure this is what Joe Fiello is going for in this clip, but this is just generally speaking to the, to the use of the word unfortunate when it comes to all of this. The founding fathers would be rolling over in their graves if, if, this, is what, if, if this is how this whole situation was being uh, characterized. All I'm doing here tonight is the exact same thing that all of our founding fathers built this country on when it came to the dozens of newspapers that they founded. All of them. The Adams family, Sam Adams and um, uh, uh, John Adams got famous because they, they put together an underground newspaper that spoke in a negative light about government officials. And th that, was like the, that was like one of the first moments where this country started to become what it became and what it has become. So if there's anything at all, I don't know if this is exactly what Joe Fiello is going for here, but if there's anything at all that the Republicans got wrong in all this, it's characterizing this whole situation and the law regarding the matter as in any way unfortunate. The unfortunate part is um, <coughs> it's a public forum, and, and, and people do find it very difficult getting up in front of it, whether it was here at a board of ed or, or somewhere where you're all videotaped. A lot of people just don't like being on, on television. Uh, in any format, and I know I don't look good on it. Uh, I, I get an extra yeah, 20 pounds. Um, so, but it's it's unfortunate. But it, it, for the sake of wanting to speak in public in our in this day and age, I think mm -hmm. you're in a difficult situation. And I, it's in, it's totally plausible to interpret that as it's unfortunate that people who speak in public comment get nervous and get uncomfortable when there's a camera in front of their face. That might be what he's talking about. And then saying, but that's the reality of 2022. We have to have these cameras in the room, right? We, like, it's, it's, there's no way to not have pitchforks and torches at the doorsteps without that. It's a perfectly plausible way to interpret that. I'm not so sure that's exactly what he's going for. So when it comes to free speech, this is what we're talking about. Places like here. When it comes to civility in, in a formal setting, when you control time, manner, and place, that's not control of speech. But when you control some, what, what I have to say, of, cor of course, outside of these meetings, that is that. And I, again, I've given you guys the way to hijack a meeting. I've given you guys the way to do it. Put Moby Dick on the counter. Show up 10 minutes before the meeting. If there's something on the meeting agenda you don't want voted on, at least at a town council meeting, you, don't, you can just read Moby Dick for five minutes. Hi, my name is Jim Smith, 123 Main Street. Blah, 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 blah. Call me Ishmael, etc. And then you read the book. Now, if you're going to do that, for the love of God, don't pick Moby Dick. Pick something else. But you're allowed to do that. And if, if it's a hot enough topic and you don't want the town council to vote on it, then, get up, get, then there will be enough people in the room to completely hijack the meeting and spend God knows how many hours just having the entire meeting be reduced to public comment. And then you have the first person go up and say, Hi, Jim Smith, 123 Main Street. There's a line of people that are behind me that are just going to use all five of their minutes to do what they're allowed to do, which is just read, to address the town council by reading from Moby Dick. And we're going to stop doing this the moment we get every one of you to come to the podium at, a, at public comment and saying, we're going to remove this agenda item from the agenda. Every one of you, right? And if you guys don't do that, then we're going to come to every single meeting. And this is kind of, this is kind of what the veterans were doing at one point. When, when Mary Jane Lundgren refused to issue an apology for what, what she did, you know, it, what she was the chairman of the DTC over in 2021, when she refused to issue, a, issue an apology and double down on it, the veterans in the room went to, to public comment and said in the public comment, we are not, we are coming to every single meeting until, until 
we at least get an apology on this matter, at least that much. We're going to come to every one of these meetings and we're going to explain just how, how bad this is. And we're going to use all five minutes of our public comment, giving Jeff McBriarty a nice, well thought out written speech that he can commit to that we all know is under five minutes. And Jeff McBriarty is going to excoriate her. And Paul Murphy is going to excoriate her. And Bob Greco is going to excoriate her. And it's just going to be a chorus line of veterans saying, this is ridiculous, Mary Jane, and you have to apologize for it. Right? And you do it and you we write it in a way, you frame it in a way that it's, that it's an addressing of the town council in a matter that is directly related to the, 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 the governance of the town council. Right? Like, in fact, you don't even have to do that. Like I said, as long as you're addressing the town council, and not saying anything illegal, there's very little that they have control over. Again, time, manner, and place, and those are not speech. So, with that said, let's get into your speech and see what the comments say. I haven't even been looking, so I imagine it's going to be kind of brutal tonight. Uh, Ray is late to the party. Well, you, you came, just like you do every week, Ray, and I appreciate it. Um, you realize children don't know how to act at a meeting their children. True, true. And those children have parents. And we can just leave it at that. Uh, Corinne Thompson, yes, I think that's it. I'm not sure what that's in reference to. Sorry, Corinne. Uh, having a hard time following along here. I uh, got nothing on YouTube. So with all of that out of the way, well, it's been way too long. It has been way too long. But hey, it's an incredibly important topic. Don't forget to share this. Thanks everyone for following along. Um, I, I just, so I can plug a few things before I sign off right real quick. When I put on my, as I put on my Lions Club hat, uh, we're going to, if you guys want to see me, I'll be with the Lions Club at the Lions Club tent, uh, goat days. That is May 21st and 22nd. I'll be there basically all day Saturday and all day Sunday. We'll have the train at the Lions Club train out. Uh, so the kiddos can have rides that they enjoyed over at Apple Fest. And that will be happy to talk to anyone who wants to come talk about what we do, membership, any of those things. And we're going to have a meet and greet on the 26th. Thursday after that, the local libertarians, the Litchfield County Libertarians Party always has their meetings on the final Sunday of each month at 2 p.m. at the Abbey. That may be changing this month because uh, that will be Memorial Day weekend. So I'll keep you guys posted on that. That's where I will be. Links to all the places where you guys can follow me are in this video's description. Uh, Rebecca Rebillard, uh, excellent show. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks to everyone who's, who's tuned in again. I, I always grateful from my audience, no matter how small or how big it is. <laughs> um, and and we'll, we will see you guys next week. I was out of town this week. That's why we're a little bit late. That's why we're using the crappy camera and having the weird 4-3 framing instead of the normal framing that we usually have. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Good night.